This is limitations on property rights, chapter four. In many cases, property rights can be quite limited. The term encumbrance is used to refer to the restrictions that limit real property rights. Government limitations. Local, state, and federal governments strictly regulate what property owners can do with their property. There are four basic government limitations or public limitations on what property owners can do with their real estate. P-E-T-E, Pete. Police power. The right of the government to regulate private activity if it's in the public interest to do so. In real estate, Police power usually refers to the local zoning ordinances and building codes. Eminent domain. The right of government to force the sale of privately owned property if it's in the public interest. Under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, the government must pay the property owner fair market value for the property. The legal process for taking the land by eminent domain is condemnation. If the government takes only a portion of the land by eminent domain, but not the whole parcel, the owner may receive severance damage. If government action in an adjacent lot of land causes a diminishment of the property value, a property owner can claim compensation under inverse condemnation. Taxes. Municipal property taxes. They are the primary source of revenue for municipal governments, the local town or city. A sheet, the reversionary interest the state maintains in all privately owned property. If a property owner dies without a will or heirs, their property transfers to the government. Zoning ordinances is a means of regulating and controlling land use. In Massachusetts, the zoning laws are found in chapter 40A, the Zoning Enabling Act. Towns often use comprehensive or master plans drafted by a planning commission to plan their future development. Zoning might include rules about use, the purpose for which property may be used. For example, residential property may be lived in, while commercial property may be used for business. Heights, building heights, setbacks, the distance from lot lines before the building is permitted, lot size, the minimum per permissible lot size, buffer zones, areas where you cannot build anything, used to ease transitions between zoning areas, for example, industrial to residential zoning. Properties can also take many forms under zoning. Single family homes, meaning detached homes, a property containing only one unit. Multifamily homes, apartment buildings, a property containing several different units, but that is not subdivided. Condominiums, subdivided units contained within shared common areas. Cooperatives, shared property owned by a company or corporation. Mixed use developments, properties containing multiple uses, for example, retail and residential condominiums. Planned unit developments, mixed use land developments that are often exempt from certain zoning regulations. There are three basic ways to bypass zoning. Non-conforming use, a legal use that is existed prior to the enactment of the current zoning ordinances. Properties are grandfathered in exempt, or exempted. Under zoning, if a structure was legal when it was built, even if the zoning has subsequently changed. Variance. Special permission to do something otherwise forbidden by zoning rules. Conditional use permits, special use permits. Think of this as a limited variance. Conditional use permits, CUPS, allow a commercial or residential use that would not otherwise be permitted in an area with the caveat that you are restricted to a specific use case that is deemed to be in the public interest. For example, a supermarket. Towns usually use these permits instead of using variances, allowing a residential property to be used commercially, which leads to converted use properties. While the process to receive a variance or conditional use permit is different in every municipality, it most often works like this. 
First, the property owner applies for building permits approval to build something with a zoning enforcement officer or building inspector to build whatever they'd like to build. The local officer or inspector will look at the local zoning rules and determine if the proposed structure is allowed. If the permits are approved, the property owner can build whatever it is that they applied for to build subject to the local rules. On the other hand, if the permits are denied or if the property owner knew that they would not be approved under existing zoning rules in the first place, the property owner can appeal the decision to the local zoning board appeals by applying for a variance or conditional use permit. The ZBA will review the application. What if any hardship is imposed on the property owner by the local zoning rules? And any negative impact that is proposed building might have on the community. Neighbors will usually get the chance to comment on community impact during the public hearing, which can influence the ZBA's final decision. Again, while the process varies, the property owner must often show that their enjoyment of the property is unreasonably impacted by the zoning rules, or that a variance or conditional use permit is necessary for their property to have worthwhile use. Often, a successful property owner will show that there is something unique about their property that requires the approval of a variance or conditional use permit so that they can fully enjoy their property rights. For example, a river that cuts through their property and is not present on other properties. Building codes. Building codes define basic requirements for construction without necessarily prescribing implementation. For example, you must have smoke detectors that meet the state standards, but not by any specific brand. A certificate of occupancy shows that a building has been inspected and found to satisfy the building codes. Both stick-built homes, homes built on a property using constru uh, traditional construction methods, and modular homes or factory-built homes, homes manufactured in pieces at a factory and then later assembled on a property, are required to meet the local building codes. Manufactured or mobile homes are sometimes held to different building code standards, though they must also satisfy the relevant regulations. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, governs construction site safety. Property taxes. Real estate property taxes are paid to the town or city, the municipality, where a property is located. Property taxes are calculated against the assessed value or tax value of property. This is known as ad valorem tax, think at value. Every property subject to tax is listed on a municipal tax roll and the total taxes collectible by the municipality will sometimes be referred to as the tax base of the municipality. Property taxes pay for local services like schools and trash pickup. Property taxes are paid in mills, dollars per 1,000 of value, expressed as a millage rate. Taxes are paid on a fiscal year running July 1st through June 30th and are due 11-1 and 5-1, or if collected quarterly, 8-1, 11-1, 2-1, and 5-1. Watch out for special assessments, which are special taxes for any betterments to your property, improvements paid for by public funds, such as town sewer hookups or sidewalks. Property owners are charged for special assessments in accordance to their frontage to the betterment over a period of years with interest. Special districts may also be used to levy additional property taxes. A special district is in an area used to charge property owners in the district extra taxes for services that they personally believe will benefit them, for example, a school or park. Private limitations. Private limitations or restrictions, also known as CC and R's, are contractual limitations on ownership created by deed or separate agreement. There are two basic kinds. Covenants. Restrictions created by the developer of a subdivision, property development, or planned unit development, a mixed-use property development, and recorded in the county registry of deeds. Covenants 
are binding on any property owners in the subdivision as long as they are deemed reasonable and within the public interest. The developer or another owner may enforce the covenants by court action, but they must usually be enforced consistently and uniformly against all property owners in the subdivision to remain legal and enforceable. Deed restrictions. Deed restrictions are limitations written into a deed. They create a fee simple defeasible estate. If the restriction is violated, the grantor who wrote the restriction or the grantor's heir has the right to demand forfeiture of the title, meaning ownership would revert back to the grantor who the restriction. Conditions run with the land, meaning that they are binding on future owners of the property as well as the current owner. Conflicts between public and private limitations. If there's ever a conflict between private restrictions and public zoning, the more restrictive rule wins. So if a private restriction limits homeowners to 2.5 story buildings, but public zoning allows up to three stories, the homeowner would be limited to 2.5 stories. Environmental limitations. Environmental laws and restrictions are of concern to property owners, especially real estate developers, since they often limit what the developer may do with the property. Under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, an environmental impact state is required to determine what, if any, environmental impacts a development might have on an area and how the developer might handle those issues. Several pieces of environmental legislation impact real estate, including the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, S-E-R-S-L-A, commonly referred to as the Superfund Act. It was designed to clean up sites contaminated with hazardous substances to create liability for those who contaminate properties. CERLA created the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. The law allows the Environmental Protection Agency to identify who is responsible for contamination of sites and compel them to clean up the sites. If the responsible party cannot be found, the EPA can clean up the site using a special trust fund. A Superfund site assessment is often used to confirm or evaluate properties' contamination. Liability under CERLA generally runs with the ownership or possession of land, so property owners or tenants not responsible for contamination but in possession when the contamination was discovered may still be held liable. This is called retroactive liability. In certain circumstances, the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, CERA, provides for innocent landowner status, which allows landowners who did not contaminate the property to avoid liability. Typically, an environmental assessment will be done before purchase to determine if the owner needs to seek immunity protections under SARA. Leaking Underground Storage Tank Program, LUST, sometimes called the UST or Underground Storage Tank Program, LUST regulates underground fuel tank installation, maintenance and spill prevention, and monitoring. It is enforced and administrated by the EPA. Certain tanks are exempt from regulation under LUST, including tanks under 110 gallons, tanks used for heating oil, mass oil, and hazardous materials release. Prevention and Response Act, Chapter 21E, the Massachusetts Superfund Act, regulates the transportation, storage, and disposal of oil and other hazardous waste in accordance with the Federal Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, CERLA, Oil Pollution Act and Clean Water Act. The Act authorizes the Department of Environmental Protection to take or arrange for response actions whenever it has reason to believe that oil or hazardous material has been released or 
or that there is a threat of release of oil or hazardous material. The Act establishes strict liability with limitations for releases or threats of release. The hazardous material needs to be identified. The Act establishes strict liability with limited expectations for release or threats of release. The Act also creates an Office of Brownfield Revitalization within the Governor's Office and allows for the certification of land as uncontaminated, 21E certification. It also requires certification of oil tanks to ensure that they are not leaking or otherwise contaminating property. The Clean Water Act of 1972 regulates pollution of navigable and connected waters, established the goals of eliminating the release of high amounts of toxic, toxic substances into the water, eliminating water pollution, and ensuring that surface waters meet standards necessary for human sports and recreations. Limits the filling of wetlands and other property development near navigable waters, especially if the filling or development would substantially degrade the water quality. National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP, established by Congress in 1968 as part of the National Flood Insurance Act and administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, requires property owners in a high-risk flood zone, think waterfront property, to purchase flood insurance if their community participates in the NFIP and if they have a federally backed mortgage. Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Massachusetts state law enforced by the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, and local conservation commissions, the town and city environmental agencies that are tasked with protecting the local nature resources. Wetlands are areas that are either permanently or seasonally wet, where the soil and the plant community have adapted to that moisture, for example, marshes or riverbeds. Wetlands are designated by the MADEP, and not all wet areas are wetlands. The Act requires a buffer zone, an area where you cannot build anything, of 100 feet from any wetlands. The DEP, or Local Conservation Commission, may permit certain minor changes after 50 feet and may also permit changes within the buffer zone, subject to the DEP's regulations throughout typical inspection. Typically, no changes are to be made to the wetland itself in densely populated areas. The Act also provides $30 million for the acquisition and protection of riverfront lands by the state and for their administration and regulation by local conversation commissions. While construction is not banned in these riverfront areas, developers must show that their proposed project will not impact riverfront area and receive permission from the area's local conservation commission in order to build. Coastal Zone Management Act, CZMA, a federal law designed to protect coastal zones like the Gulf of Mexico or Long Island from the harmful effects of real estate development. It limits or completely eliminates development in those zones. Endangered Species Act of 1973, designed to protect critically imperiled species from extinction, extinction as a consequence of economic growth and development untempered by the adequate concern and conservation, may limit property use and development if presence of an endangered species is discovered on a piece of property. Hazardous Material Transportation Act, HMTA, 
The HMTA regulates the removal, labeling, and transport of hazardous materials from a construction site. It is enforced by the Department of Transportation, DOT. LEED Certification Leadership in Energy and Environment Design, LEED, is a suite of rating systems for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of green buildings, homes, and neighborhoods. Developed by the U.S. Green Building Council, USGBC, in 1998, LEED is intended to help building owners and operators find and implement ways to be environmentally responsible and resource efficient. LEED certification also provides financial permitting incentives for environmentally friendly construction. Under LEED, buildings are rated from 0 to 100 points distributed across five major credit categories. Sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, and indoor environmental quality, plus an additional six points for the innovation in design and an additional four points for regional priority. Buildings can qualify for four different levels of certification. Certified is 40 to 49 points. Silver is 50 to 59 points. Gold is 60 to 79 points. And platinum is 80 and above. And that's LEED's certification. Environmental vocabulary. There are a few additional environmental real estate terms that sometimes appear on the exam. Accreditation, an increase of property by the gradual natural action of wind or water. The slow increase of a beach. Alolian soil is soil deposited by wind, such as sand dunes or silt. Alluvion, an increase of the land area along a shore by developed alluvium or by the recession of water, for example, a slow increase of a riverbank. Alluvium, any clay, silt, sand, gravel, or similar detrial material, such as sand, rocks, or gravel, deposited by running water. Avulsion, the sudden separation of land from one property or its attachment to another property, usually caused by flooding, a storm, or a change in the course of a river. Erosion, the process by which the earth, the process by which the surface of the earth is gradually worn down or away by natural actions, for example, water, wind, etc. Reliction, an increase of the land by sudden retreat of sea, lake, river, or other body of water. A sudden decrease in a water table. Other property right concerns. Easements. Easements are rights of way across neighboring property. The property with the right is the dominant tenant, tenement, and the one encumbered by the right is the subservient tenant. Easements are usually the right of the property, not the property owner. Oh, I'm going to restart. Easements. Easements are the rights of way across a neighboring property. The property with the right is the dominant tenement, and the property, the one encumbered by the right, is the servient tenement. Easements are usually the right of the property, not the property owner, and therefore run with the land. Transfer when ownership of the land transfers. Rights of ingress are rights of entrance. Rights of egress are rights of exit. There are several types of easements. Easement appurtenant. Easements appurtenant. Easements that involve two adjoining lots of land. One owner has the right of way across the other's property for some limited purpose. Easements appurtenant may be created in four ways. By deed. The easement is created in the deed when the property is sold. This can either come as an easement grant, where the owner of the servient tenement grants the easement, or an express reservation, where the owner of the servient ten tenement reserves the right to use a portion of the property, usually when they own the dominant tenement as well.
By implication, the seller implies an easement by the sale of the property. This often occurs when the seller intended to create an easement but failed to do so. For example, if a property is sold with no legal access to the road, but it could be accessed by crossing the lands of the seller, it might create an implied easement. Three, by necessity. If a property owner cannot legally access their property or if their land is landlocked, a court might grant an easement so that the owner can access their property. By prescription. An easement acquired by the open, notorious, continuous, hostile, and adverse use of the right of way for more than 20 years. For example, a property owner uses, for example, property owner A uses property owner B's path for 25 years. Property owner B never says anything about it. They don't give the owner A permission, ask them to stop, or post any no trespassing signs. Owner A has been using the path openly. They aren't sneaking by it at night, notoriously, continuously, and hostily, or adversely against B property rights. In this situation, owner A could go to court and prove that they've been using the path for 25 years and be granted an easement by prescription by the court. Easement appurtenance are difficult to remove once they've been put into place. Generally, there are only two ways to remove them, by combining the lots into one large lot, since an easement appurtenant requires two lots by definition, or if the purpose for which the easement was granted becomes impossible. An easement was given for road access, and there is no longer a road to access. Easement and gross. Personal easements granted in writing to someone who does not own an adjoining lot. For example, the seller of a piece of property writes into the deed that they have dock rights on the property. Easements in gross automatically extinguish when the person holding that passes away. Licenses. Personal, revocable, and non-assigned permission to enter someone else's property for a particular purpose. For example, a homeowner gives the town a six-month license to step on four feet of their front lawn while they install a sidewalk in the neighborhood, or a construction company receives a license to park their construction vehicles overnight in a nearby mall parking lot for eight months while they do work on the highway. Other examples include harvesting timber licenses, fishing licenses, and even a ticket to enter Fenway Park could be considered a type of license. Encroachments. The intrusion of an improvement. Encroachments. The intrusion of an improvement onto a neighboring property. For example, a misaligned fence. Failure to take action against an encroachment may result in the loss of the land. Again, ONCA with a 20 year time frame. Financial limitation liens. Financial limitations or liens are limitations on your ownership associated with debts or payment obligations. They can be either voluntary or involuntary, and either statutory or judicial. Liens are usually paid to according to in first, first in time, first in right, meaning that the first lien put in place is paid first, and so on. A general lien covers all property of the debtor, both real and personal. A specific lien only covers property identified by the lien. Voluntary liens. Voluntary liens make a piece of property collateral for some debt. They typically take two forms. A mortgage, used when borrowing money from a bank, usually for the purchase of real estate. The borrower, or the mortgagor, gives the bank mortgagee the right to sell their home if they do not pay the loan, evidenced in a note or IOU. The mortgage is a lien against the property in most states, though not all states. Installment sales contract. Similar to rent to own, the seller or vendor enters into a contract with the buyer, which states that the buyer will make payments until the seller has fully paid for the property. When the contract is paid in full, 
the buyer receives a deed transferring ownership of the property. Under the contract, the buyer holds what is called equitable title or future right to acquire legal title ownership to the property. If the buyer defaults on the contract, usually by non-payment, the seller keeps any of the money that the buyer has paid and the buyer does not receive the title to the property. Involuntary liens. Involuntary liens are claims against the property that are imposed by some third party, usually the government or court. Property tax liens. Claims against property for municipal property taxes. Property taxes represent a specific priority lien against real estate. This means that the taxes are paid first in the event of foreclosure, ahead of all over other lien holders, persons, or legal entities that have a lien against your property. If a property owner doesn't pay their taxes, the town or city is entitled to the property, and the property can be foreclosed on. If a property owner doesn't pay their taxes, the town or city the property is located in will foreclose on the property and provide the purchaser with a bargain and sale deed or a certificate of sale. In Massachusetts, property owners have a statutory right of redemption, also called an equity or equitable right of redemption, or the right to pay their debt and regain ownership of their home that extends six months from the date of sale at foreclosure. Land court has the right to extend this timeline. This means after a home is sold at tax foreclosure, the home ownership has up to six months to pay their unpaid taxes plus interest to get their property back. Federal tax liens. Liens placed against a person for unpaid income taxes. They are generally liens and are used by the Internal Revenue Services, IRS, to recoup tax revenue. Estate tax liens are, typical, are a type of federal tax lien used by the IRS to secure an estate's tax payments. Mechanics liens, a protection for contractors. They are allowed to place a lien against property for work that they did and weren't paid for. This only applies to work done on real estate. Personal property is not eligible for a mechanics lien. A mechanics lien is an example of a cloud on title or an issue with ownership that might create problems during a real estate sale or a statutory lien. Judgments. The final ruling by a court of law about who wins or who loses a court case often comes with an award of damages, monetary compensation, for the harm suffered by the plaintiff, the person bringing up the suit. If the defendant, the person being sued, can't pay the judgment, the court will often take their property, sell it in a sheriff's sale, and satisfy the plaintiff with the proceeds from the sale. Judgment liens are judicial liens. Attachments. A court order seizing property in order to satisfy a possible future judgment. The defendant still owns their property, but the property is attached to the lawsuit. If the property later changes ownership, it is still covered by the lawsuit and may be sold to satisfy a judgment. A lien pendens is recorded to inform the public that the property is subject to litigation. Red flags that warrant investigation. Part of working in the best interest of your client is encouraging your client to look at any red flags that may impede on their property's right. It is best practice to follow these steps before having a client make an offer on a property. Check the property's deed and plat map at the city hall or via public record. Take time to review all of the HOA, condo, or co-op documents for any restrictions. This is especially important if your client has a specific, specific concern because different communities have different restrictions. Some restrictions might include breed or weight restrictions on dogs, the number of pets allowed, or even whether or not your client can put up a fence. Be sure to review the assessor's card for tax records, such as special districts, special assessments, or recently paid taxes. If there was an assessor's card for tax records, such as special districts, special assessments, I just read that line twice. If there was a recent renovation, it is a good idea to also check if any building permits were pulled or left over. For easements or 
exclusion, exclusive rights, for example, a roof deck, asking for supporting documentation if they are not in the deed. Local restrictions might also prevent your client from using their property as a short-term rental, so be sure to check those as well. It is also a good idea to check local zoning and building regulations at City Hall if your client has a specific use for the property. Example, change use, add a garage, extension, etc. And finally, confirm whether the property is in a historical flood or wetland zone. As an agent, you should never state something as fact unless you have supporting documentation from a reliable source. Ideally, you should encourage your clients to complete their own research rather than relaying information, as this could lead to misrepresentation. And if need be, always defer to an attorney or source professional, example, tax assessor, flood agent, etc. Okay, all done.